Hello, this is Dr. Edith Ubuntu Chan. Welcome to the Dr. E Show, a show exploring the frontiers of our human possibilities in areas like health and wellness, science and spirituality, quantum biology, and conscious living, so that together we can awaken the best of ourselves and create our most joyful and fulfilling lives. Everybody knows that water is the most abundant substance on planet Earth and in our human body, and that proper hydration is critical to our health. But how much do we really understand about water? For example, did you know water has the capacity to be charged up by light, generating electricity to power our cellular function, kind of like a rechargeable solar battery system? And did you know that water can store information and memory like a liquid crystal computer? If this kind of thing fascinates you as much as it does me, then put your smoothie down and buckle your seatbelt. This is a conversation you absolutely do not want to miss. My guest today is Dr. Gerald Pollack, professor of bioengineering at University of Washington. His research into the fourth phase of water Yes, that's right. Water has four phases, not just the three they told us about in school. His research into the fourth phase of water has been deemed by scientists around the world as the most significant scientific discovery of this century. Dr. Pollack is the author of two award-winning books, including Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, and The Fourth Phase of Water, this book right here. Known around the world as an eloquent, fun, and dynamic speaker, Dr. Pollack has the unique gift of distilling complex scientific topics into simple principles that everybody can appreciate and understand. Beyond his research at University of Washington, he's also the founding editor-in-chief of The Water Journal, the director of the Institute of Venture Science, and many, many other credentials and accolades too long to list. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming the recipient of the first Emoto Peace Prize, a true pioneer amongst pioneers, Dr. Gerald Pollack. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Edith. It's great to be here with you. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. Best ever. (laughs) Thank you. You know, it's all from the heart. I've been following your work for a number of years now. I read your book cover to cover, but I have to say there's so much to learn. I feel like I could read it three or four more times before I really grasp it. I just want to say my favorite thing about you that inspires me so much is your ability to take all these complex topics and distill it down to simple principles. And that's something that I really aspire to do myself, too. Well, I think that's because I need to understand them myself. And if they're too complicated, I can't understand them. And if I can't understand them, I can't write about them. So it it boils down to uh, simplicity, you know, keep it, keep it, keep it simple. And uh, everybody is happy about that. But seriously, um, uh, this comes from the philosophy that, that nature is actually simple. Um, There's an old, uh, I mean, ancient philosophies uh, starting in uh, around 1200 or 1300 or something like this, uh, Occam's razor principle. You know, if you've got, um, if you have two, two uh, competing ideas to, to explain something, the simpler one is the one that's probably going to be, be correct. And uh, when Occam came forth with this principle, it had to do with the existence of God, not, nothing to do with science. And but the same principle applied. And then Newton came around and he took this principle and applied it to science. And he said, You know, uh, science works in the so-called shortest way possible, the simplest way possible. And many people during the past hundred years uh, or so have forsaken that principle. Uh, Nature, if you you, uh, venture to read a physics book or a a biology book, a standard book, you'll be confused because everything seems so awfully complicated. And I I think we, um, as scientists, have deviated from that that um, essential principle of, of simplicity. The scientists stand up at the podium and they, they revel in, their, in the complexity of what, what they're presenting. It's as though, look how intelligent I am because my, my mechanism is so complicated. Even yeah. I can understand it, you see. And, and I think this has a tendency to separate science, um, uh, the, the practice of science from nature, from really discovering nature. 
Uh, so anyway, for me, if I write something, if it's not simple, I scratch my head and I think this can't be right. It's too yeah. complicated. I'm reminded one of my favorite biographies, Richard Feynman's biography. What is it called? Surely you must be joking. joking. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a number of years ago when I read it, but the the biggest lesson learned from reading that was he said that if I cannot teach something new to a freshman class, it means I don't actually understand it. Ah, that's great. But but you know, Feynman's everybody everybody's hero, and I think many many people have enjoyed that book. It's just full of humor. But if you if you read uh, his scientific stuff. It's not actually so simple as all that. So one of my favorite students told me, you know, he said, Jerry, you really have to read Feynman's book on quantum electrodynamics because the stuff that we're doing in the lab is really closely related to that. So I said, okay, you know, uh, if my student says I must read it, I must read it. So I purchased the book and um, it's a paperback, Looks, looks nice, nice, nice cover and such. And I opened the book and I started reading. And the first thing that I saw was a foreword written by, presumably by a friend of his. I can't remember the guy's name, probably a prominent physicist. And, and he said, you must read this book. However, you won't understand it. And I'm scratching my head. <laughs> what do you mean? I should read this book, but I, I won't understand. He said, don't worry about not understanding it. It's really, it's so important that you really must read it, even if you can't understand it. And I'm thinking, do I, you know, I, I, I spent $9 for this book. Is it, really, is it really worth it? So I go on, and then after the foreword comes the preface written by Feynman himself. And I thought, oh, Feynman is going, going to rescue me from, from this <laughs> dilemma because, you know, do I really want to invest in that reading a book that I can't understand? So... Feynman comes on and he says, um, gee, I hope you read this book, but I'm afraid you won't understand it. And, and I'm thinking, what's he saying here? And he said, well, the reason I can assure you that you won't understand it is that my students don't understand it, and even I don't understand it, and I invented it. So, <laughs> so I ventured, despite that, <laughs> Uh, I ventured to read it. I actually, I must admit, I couldn't couldn't get past the first ten pages because I couldn't quite get it. And I think that, I think the difficulty is in what he received the Nobel Prize for for quantum electrodynamics, and the physicists have no problem understanding it. But these days, a lot of the a lot of physics and also biology to some extent lacks um, an intuitive feel. It's mostly um, or a lot of it has to do with com- with, with uh, abstract mathematics. Mm-hmm. So physics is really mathematics now, and if you if you want to understand physics, you need to understand mathematics. And I, I'm kind of led to wonder how how correct all of this is. It seems to be correct, but does nature really depend on abstract mathematics in order to um, to show her wares, or is it is it simpler than that? Is it simple cause and effect, and maybe? Maybe we haven't yet put our finger on the right cause and effect to understand it. I, I kind of wonder about it. Well, thanks for mentioning Feynman because Feynman is everybody's hero. And I think it's partly because of what he did and partly because of his great sense of humor. Mm, Amazing yeah. sense of humor. So, so where did you get this understanding that nature should be simple and easy to understand? By working in several different fields. Um, I started my career or the lo- large part of my career studying muscle contraction at the molecular level, trying to figure out how the muscle proteins uh, interact with one another to produce contraction. And the theory, the, the, the theory that has been put forth, which is uh, uh, prevailing even today, put forth by Sir Andrew Huxley, the late Sir Andrew Huxley and Hugh Huxley, um, great, great people, but the the difficulty is that this theory was not simple. It seems simple on the surface, but if you try try to apply it, if you do experiments and try to relate the experimental results to the basic theory, the theory becomes more complicated. And um, there are have been many people who've done experiments, and um, if you try to interpret it based on the currently accepted theory. It becomes uh, more and more complicated because 
because some of these interpretations are actually mutually exclusive. You know, if one is right, the other has to be wrong. And, hmm. and so it's, it's like, a, how should I say, it's like a tree growing with many, many branches in every which direction. And it's very complicated. And when you think about a theory like this, that instead of simplifying matters, actually complicates matters because so many experimental results are difficult to interpret unless you add complications to the theory. It gets to the point where it's so complicated that it's like an upside down pyramid that's going to fall of its own weight. It doesn't make any sense at all. Mm. Of course, having spent many years in the field, um, I, I became interested in alternative ideas that are simpler that can explain much more. And I wrote a book about this in, in 1990. And I, I discovered then that uh, in some fields, it almost doesn't matter what you do, um, because the people who are immersed in the field, many, many scientists, although profess open-mindedness, it feels more comfortable. It's easier to stick to a theory that you know about rather than venturing into the exploration of a theory that's new to you. So, so a lot of people are not interested in, in a fresh new idea. And for some of them, it's threatening because if they feel that they have expertise and, and, um, in understanding and using a particular theory, it's unsettling to try to move to, to some, something new. It's not only unsettling, but it's also difficult to get funding for one's laboratory. It's easier to stick with the mainstream because if you stick with the mainstream, you get to know all the people who profess the prevailing theory, and it's like a little club. And if you know one another and have good relations, and you do well, you get invited to give talks, you get funded by the granting agencies because the reviewers are those friends of yours. If you step out of the mainstream, it's so much more challenging. You yeah. see, and that, that's one of the reasons why we're on a different topic now, but it, it, it's okay. But if you ask yourself, uh, this is a good exercise. I was shocked when I first did this to, to myself. How many, ask yourself, how many scientific revolutions have taken place? Not technological revolutions. You know, we all know about iPhones and, and Zoom and, and Skype and whatever. I'm talking about fundamental scientific revolutions like, for example, the structure of DNA. Uh, it was more than 60 years ago. The splitting of the atom more than 70 years ago. I mean, really fundamental. How many of those can you name that have taken place in the last 30 years or 40 years? I've asked the question to many people, and mostly I get a blank stare. Yeah. Uh, oh, gee, who? Hmm. Uh, hmm. I can't think of any right now, but but maybe a few people have come forth with, with some. But the surprise is that 100 years ago, when so much was coming out of science, particularly in physics, but also in, in other areas, practically every year there was something that came forth that, that was a, a revolution. Now it's really hard to think of, of scientific revolutions. And the amount of money that's being put into science now compared to 100 years ago well, I don't know what the ratio is, but uh, it's probably a thousand to one or something like that. There were few organizations at that time that fund science. Now there are multiple organizations with, with uh, budgets in the tens of billions of dollars. And despite that, it's really hard to think of, of a, a, a scientific revolution that, that's occurred in, in modern times. Something so what's the solution to that? What do you feel is public funding instead of government funding, or is it driven well, by money? The solution is something that, well, we've, we've actually instituted something. You had mentioned it earlier. It's the Institute for Venture Science. And so the, the problem with the current system uh, is this. I, I have to discuss the problem before the solution. So, mm -hmm. so the problem is, let's say I'm proposing... Um, that the earth is round, okay. And, um, and suppose the community knows that the earth is flat because this is the prevailing paradigm. And I come to the granting agency with an application to, uh, for funding and I say, you know, I've seen evidence that suggests that the earth is round. Um, for one, I see some satellite pictures and it kind of looks round, it doesn't look flat. And besides, I took off from Seattle, you know, and I, I went to the West and I, 
I landed in, in Shanghai, and then from Shanghai, I went on to London, and from London to New York and back to Seattle again. I looked out the window, and I couldn't see the edge of the earth if it's flat. And I was able to return. There must be some edge. So please give me some money, because if, if the earth is really round instead of flat, this is really important. Um, and so it goes to the granting agency, and, um, and you're, you're the gatekeeper, and you see this application, and you say, oh, this looks pretty interesting. If, if this guy is right, this is really major stuff. We should recruit the most knowledgeable and prominent experts on the shape of the earth to review this, to see if this guy is, is not crazy. So you can imagine what happens. The people that you recruit are going to be the world experts on the shape of the flat earth, the, mm-hmm. the experts, and they're looking at a, a proposal that challenges their, their supremacy, or the, mm-hmm. their uh, status. So people are people, you know, and, um, and you sit around, sit around the review table and you look at this application from this outsider who comes up with this strange idea that the earth is round and you scratch your head and you think, well, gee, you know, this actually looks like a pretty cogent application, but if this guy is right, I lose. And, and um, not only do I lose, but all the other people sitting around the review table who are in the same field, more or less, they also lose. Mm-hmm. And so what's your reaction? Well, self-protection. You say, well, this is a kind of interesting proposal, but the applicant has not quite um, uh, suggested the, the, the ideal kinds of experiments to do this. He should rewrite the application and submit it again. And, and the applicant gets a score that's just shy of funding, you know, a, a, a reasonable score. Um, and so it doesn't work. And, and you apply this not only to the shape of the earth, but to every aspect of science. And the sociology is the same. Mm-hmm. If you challenge the people who do the review, you lose. So it's, it's kind, of, kind of like, um, you know, the French revolutionaries um, uh, coming to the court of Louis XVI and saying, we, ha- we have a few gripes. Would you listen to us? And yeah, well, sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll listen to you, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So, so it doesn't work. So this is the problem. The upshot of all this is round earth ideas have almost no chance and, uh, of success. And if they can't get money to do their research, they, get, they can't do experiments, they get no recognition. And, you know, the, their ideas fall into the basement of obsolescence. Uh, just nothing, nothing happens. And um, investigators who are canny know that they simply do not propose radical ideas to the granting agencies because they won't succeed. And once you get a reputation as being radical, people, people question your sanity and it's difficult in the future once you get that reputation. Oh, you know, crackpot, we're, we're not even going to look seriously at his application. Mm-hmm. So the system is not designed to really innovate. It's, it's designed to add flesh to the bones of some existing structure. It does that pretty well. But in terms of radical ideas, no, uh, it doesn't work. So we designed the Institute for Venture Science to, to get around that. And what we do is um, we invite applications and we entertain only applications that, that propose a radical idea that overthrows an existing paradigm. And we go through those and we select the best ones and we invite uh, fuller applications. They're now actually un- under review right now as I, as I speak. And the idea is uh, to pick out the ones that are most far-reaching, the ones that have the capacity to shake the earth maximally, and uh, an investigator who has the capability of pulling it off. But that doesn't quite solve the problem, because if you are proposing round earth, uh, and you get some money to study round earth, and you get positive results on round earth, the problem is that the, um, uh, the, the people who are flat earth people will dig their heels in even more. Uh, because they don't want to be overthrown. It's just human nature. Well, yeah, I think we we can understand that. And so we deal with that problem too. And how we deal with it is if if we fund your round earth proposal in a flat earth world, uh, once we do, we're going to be looking for up to 10 or 12 independent laboratories who will pursue the same idea 
uh, together with you. I don't mean by together at the same time, but independently. So then you have a situation where, where you go to the annual meeting of the Shape of the Earth Society, and you've got a dozen groups reporting using different methods that, hey, you know, it really looks like the Earth is round and not flat. It then becomes difficult for them to ignore because they, you know, they could say that, uh, oh, Edith, she's a crackpot. <laughs> but they can't say that this dozen groups of people are crackpots. And by the way, they're getting handsomely funded by an organization. So once that happens, um, we, we can envision that paradigm shifts will be occurring rather quickly within a matter of a, a few years. And the most um, powerful of those, uh, far-reaching, are basically scientific revolutions. So, so our organization, the Institute for Venture Science, um, it's ivscience.org, uh, or uh, the reason I say or, we have a new website uh, under that name. The old website is IV sci.org we're changing it to iv science because it's easy to remember yeah. .org so one of those two will will get you there and uh, it contains a description of what what we're doing and we think this is going to change the face of science in a positive way wow thank you for doing that work how are you able to get the buy in from so many people is it through your generosity in doing these kinds of interviews and just getting all of us to become aware of this fundamental problem that is is essentially keeping progress down for all of humanity. So in the end, we all lose. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not sure. It's, it's partly, I, I give talks and um, uh, the, the talks are on, on water because that's what we, we do right now. And people who attend these talks, and usually the last slide is about the Institute for Venture Science or the next to last slide, and people become interested. And I think they become interested because they like the stuff that we do on water. But it's not just, it's not just that. That's a small part of it. People become interested because there's a growing recognition that something is wrong with science, that um, a lot of knowledge is being produced, but not much understanding, not yeah. much additional understanding. Yes. Uh, and this is the, the the yes I got from you is is characteristic of what what many people say that there's so much that you can't keep track of all that's coming out. But in terms of new fundamental understanding of nature, uh, there's not so much of it. It just becomes more complicated. Um, yeah. And I think more and more of us on a personal level are really being shaken up by how across the board financial systems medical system, educational system, so many levels of how our society runs is just not working anymore. It's at a breaking point. And I think we all have personal stories about how that breaking point is happening in our own lives. And it's making us ask these fundamental questions. How can we create a different society where everybody wins? I, I, I so much agree with that. That's, that's really well put. Uh, I really appreciate that. I, I, yeah, we're broken and we need to repair it. And one aspect of that is, of course, is, is science. Science is broken too. And it's, it's, it, it's been a gradual process. And I think it's reached the point where many people are coming to realize that that's the case. And that's why we're beginning to get buy-in from people. And we're, this is not government funded. This is funded by people who have done well and want to do something for humanity. And this is something that people can do for humanity because you know, we, we have so many problems to solve, as you mentioned. And some of, some of the solutions are political in nature, for sure, but other, others can depend on technology. And the technology today is based on yesterday's science. Uh, we need today's science to build new technologies, technologies that we could never have dreamed of um, and, and they will come just as essentially every fundamental scientific discovery um, uh, creates the uh, fruits, and those fruits are new technologies. Um, so let's go ahead and switch gears because our audience is at all different levels of knowledge about your fourth phase of water work. Could you give us a quick introduction, how you came to discover and work with the fourth phase of water, and what are the implications in terms of technology? Um, you got a few hours? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, okay, well, if, if, if I wander too much, please, uh, please stop me. I think you started with, how did you get interested in this stuff? And, and what I, is the fourth phase water, easy water? 
Yeah, okay. So it's, let me give a little background. I'll tell you the, the easy water or fourth phase is a phase of water. It's a kind of ordered phase of water that that people had actually predicted uh, a long time ago. And, and we have now clear evidence for its existence. And um, it's all over the place, including it's the water that fills your body. And so it has really important implication for biological function, because if you make the assumption that the water that's inside your body is like water in a glass, it's not correct, you see, and you come up with answers that don't make sense. So I just want to, with that sort of introduction, I started um, some years ago, um, there was a guy named Gilbert Ling, L-I-N-G. Gilbert came from China after World War II. Uh, he's now 98 or 99 years old, alive and kicking, um, and still actively thinking about water. He wrote, I think, seven books. And by the way, he came, he came with, there were three, uh, three scholars from China, uh, chosen throughout China to come to the U.S. to study in famous laboratories. Um, he was a biologist, there was a physicist, and I forget the third guy, but the physicist won the Nobel Prize. And they all thought that Gilbert was actually the smartest of the three, Gilbert Ling. And so um, Gilbert studied what happens in cells, and he started in controversial ways, suggesting that some of the preconceived ideas about how cells work don't agree with the evidence, and they're flatly wrong. Um, and one of those included the water inside the cell. And he said that the water in the cell is not like water in the glass. The water molecules are actually ordered. He called it structured, ordered in some way. So, so in other words, you, you'd have the molecules uh, like little dipoles, plus and minus, and, and they would be lined up with one another in some kind of ordered way, containing these strings of water molecules that were all ordered, as opposed to what happens in a glass of water, where the molecules are disordered and bouncing around at a huge number of times per microsecond, or even femtosecond. And his ideas, of course, were controversial. Uh, I happened to meet him, finally, at a conference in Hungary, and this conference was uh, designed to honor, uh, to commemorate the work of uh, a famous biophysicist. And this guy, did, this biophysicist, had two fields. One was muscle contraction and the other was water. So I was invited to present on muscle contraction because this guy thought the prevailing view was not correct. And so I was there to second his, his motion. <laughs> and what year was this? Oh, it was in, nine, in the um, early 1980s or 85, something like that, 83. And I met Gilbert Ling at that meeting because this guy was interested in water as well, so water and muscles. And not only Gilbert Ling, but there were a dozen other people who had evidence in favor of Gilbert Ling's idea. And I became so impressed with this concept of ordered water uh, that I came back and I got one of Gilbert's books they're challenging to read and not, not easy. And I gave it to my students and postdocs, and every one of them said, this guy is onto something. I'm sorry, I hit the table again. <laughs> this guy is onto, and maybe I should pound. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is onto something really important. I felt exactly the same. And so I started to deviate from, from the muscle contraction field to because it was such com compelling interest in, in water, since water is, well, as, as you said earlier, the most abundant molecule, certainly in our bodies. I thought, you know, if this guy is right, then essentially all of biology needs to change because modern concepts in cell biology don't take this into account. And properties of this kind of water are so different from properties of ordinary water that uh, it would form a revolution, a new new basis. In fact, one of Gilbert's books is called Revolution in the Biology of the Cell, or something like this. So my first task in immersing myself was to write a book. I, I decided that because Gilbert's writing is, is, is challenging, even for physical chemists, what I tried to do is to bring forth his ideas in, a, you might say, a simplified manner, accessible to people without a PhD in physical chemistry, some of whom still can't follow what's in Gilbert's book, books. And I did that. The book was Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. And the first few chapters more or less summarize what Gilbert had done. But 
I went I went somewhat beyond uh, Gilbert, and I suggested in that book that the evidence was consistent with a, a very simple idea that the transition between ordered water that Con Gilbert was talking about and ordinary water was actually the trigger of many fundamental biological cell functions like muscle contraction, cell division, transmission of information in nerves, etc. Uh, so many of the most fundamental attributes of cells could be explained by a trigger, a transition, a phase change, if you will, from the order to disordered water. So the book was published and it got mixed reviews. Some people were extremely enthusiastic and other people said, this is the biggest nonsense in the world. And I, I was proud of that response because it was Albert St. Georgi, the, you know, the father of modern biochemistry, who, who said the only times that he knew that he was onto something really important were when, when the reactions were polarized, very positive and very negative. Then he knew he was onto something important. And I guess that fell into, into that category. But you know, being a curious guy, I wanted to to do experiments on this kind of water. And at first, we couldn't figure out how to do it. And then finally, something came to light, maybe by by serendipity. I, I met a, a Japanese investigator at a at a meeting who was telling me about some experiments that he was doing with weird weird observations. Um, he was looking at gels, and he had actually created a tunnel inside of a gel. And um, uh, so if you could imagine a, a gel and with um, a tunnel running through it like, like, like this, and he created it, I'm pretty sure, by, by putting a, um, a needle in and pulling the needle out as, the gel, as it was gelling. So you mm-hmm. get a pedal. Mm-hmm. And, and he was looking at the flow of water containing little particles. And this is, was supposed to simulate what happens in a blood vessel. So he, he took this tunnel as an analog of a blood vessel, and, and he was looking with a microscope because the gel was clear and he could see through it. And he and his students found something weird that they paid no real attention to, and that is the microspheres avoided the edges of the tunnel. They actually concentrated at the core. So there was a region, an annular region in the tunnel just inside the, the gel, like a uh, yeah, an a- annulus that was free of these particles or microspheres. They were using little spheres, micron-sized spheres. And he told me, as we were sitting and having lunch together, he said, you know, this is a weird phenomenon. His students had seen it, and they never really thought twice about it because well, it was something or other. They just ignored it because it wasn't in their field of interest. And I became so excited because I thought that this annulus that was free of microspheres was actually a region of ordered water. Because when the water is ordered like a crystal or structured like a crystal, it pushes out everything as the crystal forms. Just like when ice forms, it, it pushes out all kinds of debris and you get a pure crystal of, mm. of, of ice. So it's got to get rid of everything first. So I said to him, please, can you publish this? He said, well, yeah, sure, we can, we can publish it. And... I said, please publish it soon because I want to put it in my book. I want to describe it because I think it's really important. I was then coming forth with the cells, gels, and the engines of life book. And uh, so nothing happened. So I contacted him again and I said, how is it coming? He said, well, you know, we're making some progress. And uh, after the fifth email or so, I think in the polite Japanese way, he wanted me off his back. <laughs> and he said, look, you know, we've got to do our thing and I'll make you a co-author on the paper. I said, I'm not interested in being a co-author on the paper. I'm interested in you publishing the paper because I think the results are so interesting. I think he's not published the paper to this day. This was 18 years ago. <laughs> but as luck would have it, a, a student who was in his laboratory came to my university and I met him and we started doing experiments together. He knew the technology that this guy was using. And so we quickly set up and we, within six months to a year, we had determined that indeed this region that he was talking about where the microspheres were excluded, we called it the exclusion zone because you got to call it something was actually a region of ordered water. And by molecular standards, this is huge because the the region that they were talking about was something like a hundred or two hundred micrometers that is two tenths of a millimeter and 
by molecular standards, the, the number of molecules lined up that you need to line up to, to get to a couple of hundred micrometers is like a million or something like that. Huge number of molecular layers. And so it appeared that this exclusion zone, which we later called fourth phase of water, is so big. It's, um, it's so big as to astonish physical chemists who see it. So what it means in terms of you know non non experts is that there's a lot of this stuff. It's all over the place. So that was that's how we got into it uh, to start with. And from then on, the phenomenon was so intriguing because um, oh, we found that all you need to set it up is a surface like a gel surface, a surface that's hydrophilic that is water loving. So as you know, as opposed to hydrophobic, like Teflon, where you drop some water and it beads up instead yes. of spreading out. So hydrophilic. So as long as you have a hydrophilic surface, um, not every hydrophilic surface we found, but most that we studied, create, when water meets a hydrophilic surface, the water near the surface transforms itself in, into this special phase of water. We did a lot of experiments to find out more about this and you know, a lot, this appears in the book that you showed earlier, The Fourth Phase of Water, which has become popular. Let me just summarize the two or three maybe m- most important attributes of this that we found. So one of them is that it's charged. It's not neutral. Ordinary water is neutral, but this phase of water has typically negative charge. And the region beyond it, the region of water, has the equivalent positive charge. So the charges are actually split. And the reason they're split is that the water molecule and near these surfaces, the water molecule uh, breaks into the negative and positive parts. So the negative is OH minus and the positive is H plus. That makes it water. But energy comes from outside. I'll tell you about the energy in a moment. And splits the water. And all the negatives line up near that hydrophilic surface. And the positives spread out in the water beyond. And so you have a separation of charge with uh, negatives clustered together, uh, forming some some structure, and the positives um, outside that. So with this separation of charge, it's potential energy. It's like a battery. You have minus in one one region and plus in another region. And we've been able to, uh, you mentioned technologies, we've been able to exploit this, put one electrode in the negative, one electrode in the positive, and you get enough energy to light a light bulb. Um, so it's cool, you know, because the water contains energy. And so, of course, we needed to figure out you can't get something for nothing. And so it can't just be that the water gets energy somehow. Right. It, it must get it from somewhere else. And, and we found out that where that energy comes from is light. It's a bit like photosynthesis, you know, in the case of photosynthesis, this first step in photosynthesis is um, light. So light hits the plant. And the first step in the photosynthetic uh, chain of processes is the splitting of water into OH minus and H plus is pretty much the same as what we discovered. And so we think that what we discovered may be a kind of generic first step of photosynthesis. It, it looks pretty much the same, but we know a lot more about about the generic process than people seem to know about the first step of photosynthesis because ordinarily plus and minus don't like to separate. They attract each other. Why should they separate? Mm. And, and we've elaborated how this can actually happen in a way that doesn't violate these fundamental laws of, uh, of, of physics. So, so what kind of light? Um, well, it turns out that the most effective light of all is infrared light. A lot of people don't, are not familiar with infrared. You know, you think infrared comes from um, um, from the toaster. You see the glowing coils, right? And you say, "Oh, it's it's hot. It looks like there must be infrared that's being generated." But well, fact, many of us are health nuts who've had the experience of infrared saunas. Well, there you go, infrared sauna. And so, yeah, many many of you know. And and, and I want to talk about that because. Why do you feel good when you've been to in an infrared sauna or any sauna? And any sauna is basically going to generate the heat. Out of the heat comes infrared. But, but actually, there's infrared all around. It's not just so you get an abundance of it in, in, in the sauna. But um, if I were to take out my infrared camera and 
if we were sitting in the same room, we turned out all your lights, so you couldn't see anything. I pulled out my camera. I could get a beautiful image of you and your glasses and your um, knuckles and your hand and and your sweater and and the whiteboard behind you. Everything is generating infrared because infrared cameras are sensitive to infrared wavelengths, not visible wavelengths, and you get a beautiful image. So, so what it means is that is that the energy that you need to build this kind of water is all around, and therefore, since it's always there, you get build up of EZ water, fourth phase water, all the time. There's a, a steady value so long as the infrared energy is around. If you add infrared energy, as in a sauna, you get more of it. And it's really powerful. Uh, small amounts of, of infrared can build the EZ by a factor of 10, for example. And so... Can you have too much EZ water? Is there like a saturation point? It's a good question. Uh, uh, I don't know the answer, but I can speculate mm-hmm. um, that there there probably is a saturation that you can't just go and, and build and build. And um, and I, I'm thinking of of the cell. Um, uh, and see, so the cell is so packed with molecules, and the molecules are interconnecting. It's kind of like a lattice. So if if you try to build more and more easy water inside that lattice, what you're doing is straining the lattice. And the lattice is consisting of solids and it can just strain just so much. Uh, it, it's, um, it's like taking a rubber band and trying to stretch it. You know, you can stretch it, but you reach a point where it becomes almost impossible to stretch anymore. And if you can imagine the, stressing, the stretching force being the buildup of easy water, it probably reaches a limit. And beyond that, you, you can't can't build anymore. That's just a speculation because nobody, is, as to my knowledge, has made made that measurement. But but you you know you bring us back to to health and to to biology. And I'm shifting to an, another topic, and I I will unless you tell me to. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. It's all exciting and interesting. Please. Well, I think so too. I, I'm tremendously excited about uh, about all this. Basically, we need easy water in our cells to function. So. When you think about function of a cell, you think about proteins. Proteins fold and then unfold. So they go from from one condition to another condition like that. The the normal um, environment around each protein is easy water. Mm -hmm. So if easy water is is there um, and the environment is natural, when when a stimulus comes, what happens is this, this easy water is, begins to melt into ordinary water and the protein then folds. And when it unfolds, um, then the easy water builds back up again. So the easy water is, you can't really separate the protein from the easy water. The two are contiguous and the two are a single entity. Mm. You need this water to, to function. Now, if you're dehydrated, um, as I know I am, because I haven't prepared any water to drink, and I'm just back from an international trip. So um, you, you're, you don't function as well. Your cells don't function uh, as well because the proteins that are responsible for function must have this water. Otherwise, you don't know where they are. They're, they're in a strange environment. So if you're thinking, for example, about a muscle cell around the actin and the myosin, got to have this water. Uh, and if you don't have the water, then the protein is in a strange environment. It doesn't know what to do, and your muscle is not functioning properly. You need to rehydrate, which means building up this easy water uh, again. See, So what that leads to is a hypothesis for maintaining good health. And one, one way of maintaining good health is through hydration, which we translate into buildup of easy water. That's the same as, as hydration. By the way, a good book coming out on hydration by uh, Gina Bria and her colleague whose name uh, escapes me, but uh, it's called uh, Quench. 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 Yeah, it's coming out, um, I think, this month, and it's really interesting about hydration and also relates to easy water and hydration. So mm-hmm. how do you build easy water in your cells, in your, in your body? Well, method number one is exactly what you mentioned right? It's, it's infrared, it's a sauna. Um, you expose yourself to infrared, the infrared is absorbed inside your body, and it builds easy water. And I would hypothesize that the reason you feel better when, 
when you come out of a sauna is is because you you've built easy water in regions or cells that were deficient that were shy of easy water so if you start with a headache you know you, you, one, one idea is is that uh, the cells your brain cells are not properly hydrated and if you receive the infrared energy, it builds up that easy water and your brain is then functioning normally or the muscles around your brain. So, so first of all, we need to drink enough bulk water. And totally. then secondly, have some mechanism to enhance the easy layer. That's right. So the bulk, So one thing is for us to drink water because water is the raw material uh, to, for building easy water, ordinary H2O. Easy water is H3O2. It's a completely different structure is what we, we deduced. But that, that is absolutely one way. But, you know, sometimes the water comes in and goes out pretty, pretty quickly. And so another way you can do it is through juicing, um, you know, squeezing, squeezing the juice out of, out of green plants. And I, I've heard from various naturopaths and alternative medicine people that, that, this is the easiest way to get healthy is, is, is to take drink drink this juice on a regular basis. And I know that uh, Dr. Mercola in, in in his blog he, he talks about that also as a, as the single best way and easiest way to to do it. And the various people I've spoken to naturopaths, some of them the patient comes in and complains of this or that, and no matter what the complaint, start juicing. And the reports I've heard from them, these are, of course, anecdotal. There are no clinical trials that I know of. Anecdotal reports uh, suggesting that they get better. They also lose weight, by the way, but they get better. And so um, a- after six months or so, they're back a few times, and and whatever was ailing them, is the problem is, is reduced. And so the reason, I think, is the same paradigm that what you're doing by drinking this juice is you're the green plants and you're squeezing out the water that's inside the cells of those plants. And that water has EZ in it, just filled with EZ and, and the plants are, it's fresh growth, the cells are healthy. And so there's plenty of EZ water. So you're transferring EZ water from the plant into directly into your body and thereby presumably helping to replace the missing EZ water from, from your cells. So this is one, one idea as to why juicing can be so, so effective. Another way of doing it is earthing or grounding. I know you know about that. What you're doing is connecting yourself to negative charge because if you, for example, walk barefoot on the beach, you feel good after it. Almost everybody feels good. And the reason that you feel good is that you're connecting yourself to a, a vast reservoir of negative charge. And so your body, you know, it usually... If your body is deficient in easy water, if you if you connect yourself to negative charge, negative charge is one of the components of easy water. You need to convert the water from neutral to negatively charged. And so absorbing that negative charge facilitates that process. See, and so a hypothesis again is a reason that you feel you feel better is 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 exactly that, that you this negative charge seeps into your body and helps build easy water. So that's another way of caring for your, your health. There are a couple more if you want, or if you want to. Yeah, please, because oh. I'm, I'm just checking my work. These are everything you've mentioned so far, are all things that are in my super wellness book. So I'm starting to see my entire book from beginning to <laughs> end, the perspective of easy water, actually. Oh, okay, well. Uh, I have I, 300 pages of lifestyle practices in there, healthy lifestyle practices, and I'm seeing that most of them, even including hugging your dogs and cats and snuggling with your grandchildren that is exchange of infrared heat isn't it so how how many years do you have before you have grandchildren <laughs> well <laughs> i have a three and a half year old right now uh well so another you, 20 more years uh 20 how about hugging your children yeah any furry pets uh uh-huh. well not only furry pets but um but also hugging Hugging anything that's living. So my friend was talking to me about hugging trees. You know about that? Yes. Yeah. And um, it's kind of the same thing because uh, the tree is negatively charged and, and trees, plants have a lot of negative charge. And so if you put your hands around the tree and hug the tree for five or 10 minutes, you should get a substantial transfer of negative charge in your body. Or if you hug your grandkid or kid, you you might get it also because... 
you know, kids are usually pretty healthy and full of negative charge. Ne- negative charge, uh, unfortunately, it should have been called positive because the connotation is is backwards. We, um, I, I think of negative charge or negativity as health. Most people think of negativity as the opposite. Yeah. And it's Benjamin Franklin's fault for calling it negative instead of positive. But anyway, yeah, the negative charge is really important. And hugging, hugging grandchildren and hugging trees. It was George Washington. The story, the story goes, who was feeling ill one day, and his personal physician said, "Wow, the solution is very simple. Just go hug a tree." And and as the story goes, ten minutes of hugging the tree he was feeling just fine. So that is another thing to do. Uh, yet another one is from the Ayurvedic tradition onward. You know, many herbs and spices and such are said to be good for health. Turmeric, for example. Why, why is turmeric um, uh, good for health as it appears to be in, in most people? Um, or coconut water, coconut oil and such. We tried a half dozen of these and we have a paper that is now under review all of them build easy water, it turns out. Mm. Uh, I was astonished by this. Um, so one possibility is, is that many of the herbs and other substances that are known through the tradition to be good for health, one possibility is that the reason that they're good for health is they build easy water. And easy water is necessary for, for proper function or for health. So Any hypothesis about how acupuncture, applying a stainless steel needle to the body, might change the easy water? N- not offhand. Um, I'm sorry. Um, um, I don't know an answer to that and that question. Um, um, it surely works. I've had it myself. Yeah. Done. Um, actually, a root canal done uh, on, under. Uh, um, with acupuncture, and it was great. <laughs> no after effects at all. I, I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that. I mean, it's possible that the meridians are uh, actually representing areas of high concentration of easy water. Somehow, sticking the needle in might have some impact on 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 those meridians. But I've not spent time studying that, and I I, I can't even speculate intelligently on how that might work. But I know mm. it works. Um, mm, okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for stimulating me to, to think about it. There, there's just one more that I, I shouldn't fail to mention, and, and that is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, are you familiar with that? Yeah. Or in my book, I recommend people do breathing practice to hyperoxygenate because that is cheaper and free. Of course, hyperoxygen therapy or ozone therapy, both are quite popular in alternative. Okay, well, I, yeah, I have no comment on, on that, but so n- n- maybe what I, my response is going to be relates also to, are you then getting more oxygen in, into the system? Well, the idea is, is actually inspired by my friend Wim Hof, who wrote the foreword to my book, his breathing method, he has something that's really interesting. His method has to do with conscious mind training, yeah. a very specific kind of breathing training, and then exposure to ice cold water. Oh, yeah, I, I know. Right. And he can yeah, sit so in water for an hour without perishing. Close to two hours, yeah. Two hours, wow. Yes, he can wow. sit in a tank of ice. And many of his students can do that for substantial periods of time that kind of defy your previous concept of what is humanly possible just through you know a weekend of training we can tap into these new possibilities but the breathing the idea is that you as i understand it i'm not a certified instructor but i've done some workshops is you inhale more than you exhale how can you do that so you do a more aggressive inhale and then you let it go, but you don't really forcefully push it. And you inhale so much until the point that you feel like you don't want to inhale anymore and you stay in this breathless state. But the exchange, find- the exchange must be, I mean, in a steady state, you must exhale as much as you inhale, don't you? Isn't that true or not? No. So apparently that mo- most adults are breathing a much a small percentage of their full capacity on a regular basis. Okay. How yeah, so we're actually tapping closer to 100% capacity of, of our lung function. 
So does that does that mean you're actually gaining more oxygen? Uh, yes, than, that's yeah. that's what the studies are okay. showing. Okay, so so yeah, so we go go back then to the hyperbaric oxygen. So I'm not touting the hyperbaric oxygen, but it's just from a scientific point of view, uh, you're getting there. There's more oxygen uh, in in the, in the chamber, and so we did studies to see what happens to easy water if you add more oxygen, and it gets bigger. We, the oxygen expands, the uh-huh. water. and it's understandable because easy water has compared to the hydrogen has relatively more oxygen than ordinary water. Um, the ratio of oxygen to hydrogen is higher. So if you expose a system to higher oxygen, you're going to get more easy water. And, and, that, and that's what we found. And um, the same we found for high pressure. So if you increase the pressure, you get more easy water. Uh, in other words, increase the pressure from the ambient uh, pressure. And, and, and so... So it strikes us that the reason hyperbaric oxygen is apparently so good for numerous syndromes, uh, I, I know that the companies are actually working to to try to gain approval for using hyperbaric oxygen for up to thirty different different syndromes, and yes. and and so interesting that uh, a particular modality is so effective for so many diverse issues, and I think it's possible that the reason is high oxygen. And high pressure build easy water, um, and and you need easy water all over your body. So so this is this is another area that I think that easy water is 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 relevant. That's and, fascinating. What about things that are? If you don't have another great one, I'd love to flip it around. What are things that decrease your easy water or damage your easy water? This is an area where we're just actually getting into. We we spent the last decade or so trying to figure out what builds easy water and not what destroys easy water. But we do have a, a few things that, that we know. So, for example, if you add a lot of salt to the water, if you add small amounts of salt, the, the, there's not much effect. But when you go to higher amounts of salt, the easy diminishes in size. We also find that sometimes positively charged substances have a, a tendency to diminish the size of the easy. I can't say a lot. Uh, more than that, oh, what I can say, we think that poisons uh, do this. So we've actually looked at, at a few, we looked at glyphosate, you know, the weed killer that's in, mm-hmm. in Roundup. And we did a dose response curve and we found that even at extremely low concentrations, it diminishes the size of the EZ. So it kind of led to a speculation that it's possible that many poisons, not not just life is it, but many poisons act by deleting or diminishing easy water. You don't have easy water, you can't function. And Slightly controversial question, that what about fluoride and chlorine? Does it decrease easy water? I wouldn't be surprised, but we haven't tried it. Uh, I, that's one of the things that's on the list, uh, uh, trying, because yeah. I, I know there are studies that suggest, and many of my friends tell me that this stuff is poison, uh, yeah. that we're... It, um, drinking. We also found that anesthetics decrease it. So um, we tried we tried several local anesthetics. Uh, we tried lidocaine and um, uh, bupivacaine, and we also tried a general anesthetic. And all of them diminished easy water. And you know the anesthetics diminish function at least transiently. And so so the fact that we've seen it with anesthetics and we've seen it with at least one poison. It suggests um, there might be a generality and that any any substance that diminishes easy water will diminish function and will therefore be a poison. We Obviously, we can't say all of them, but so one of the difficulties is that, you know, a lot of the people who do these experiments are undergraduates and uh, we like to be a bit conservative with uh, exposure of these students to to poisons, and so that's one of the limiting factors in doing the experiments. Uh, we need to have people who who really know how to handle this stuff and doing it properly. Yeah. But there are many other other poisons to try and see see what happens. Uh, what about um, EMFs, Wi-Fi's, radio frequencies, microwaves? Have you tested different frequencies? We we haven't uh, a whole lot, but there's there's one um, really interesting video that I watched recently. Um, so it was a uh, Dr. Um, uh, Mercola 
Dr. Mercola interviewing Dr. Dietrich Klinghart. I don't know if you know him, but he's uh-huh. he's a, a friend of mine in Seattle, and he's very well known in, in the naturopathic uh, community. And it's just exactly on this question. And he talks, it's so interesting. I, it's really compelling. It's one hour of fascination. And he talks about his patients that he he deals with patients with really severe neurological issues. And the first thing he tells them to do is to turn off the Wi-Fi at night. And the ones who turn turn it off at night actually do better than the ones who don't turn it off at night. Uh, really I confused. found that clinically in my practice too. A Is that lot right? Of logical patients and um, insomnia and anxiety patients, when they remove the Wi-Fi exposure, especially at night, it, it, it's a complete game changer to people's health. Really, a complete yeah. game changer. Yes, and I'm starting. There's luckily we have one of the best um, EMF testing companies is here in Northern California, and so we're able to have access to that company to come and physically scan your space to look at where there's high, they scan electrical fields, magnetic fields, and radio frequency fields, and where there's unusually high activities. And often they find low-hanging fruits. Like if you just move your hub two feet this way, it, it drops off in an inverse square law. So it's very, once you measure it, you can make very smart decisions about how to move your devices around. How how interesting! Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the the generality of it is that there's now a lot of evidence that that this is a problem for us. It's a serious health problem. Um, there was one guy whose laboratory was right next to mine, and he retired, and he's studying the effects of electromagnetic waves. And he tells his the students in the class, he says, you know, the studies that are funded by the cell phone companies, ninety five percent of those studies report no problem. The, the studies that are funded by uh, outside agencies, 95% report a big problem. Yeah, so, yeah so, for our yeah. listeners, I want to encourage everybody to check out this documentary that just came out. It's called Generation Zapped, Z-A-P-P-E-D. And it, I learned so many new things. It turns out that our exposure to EMF fields now compared to 10 years ago, Jerry, how many times higher would you guess we're being exposed to? How many years ago? Uh, what you were talking From about? From ten years ago, when the first iPhone came out. Uh, well, I probably guess ten times or more. <laughs> um, uh, so we went from one G to two G to three G to four G. We're yeah. about to go five G, and everybody has many devices now instead of just every other person at one device. Well, maybe fifty times. <laughs> Well, I didn't even know this number before. You're a scientist. Maybe you know this number. It is actually one quintillion times. More. Uh, how, how many zeros is that? That's um, 18 zeros. 18, 18 zeros. So if if our technology years. is driven by the interaction of frequencies with water, with electricity, if this is your research is indicating that the most fundamental substance on the planet Earth is sensitive to light and energy, and it generates electricity. That's what drives everything. I feel we have a big issue to look at. A very, very big issue. Yeah, and it's really scary to to know that it's getting worse uh, with the five G. Where do you go to get to get rid of it? <laughs> it's yeah. It's first, we have to become aware because I think um, as an alternative medicine doctor myself, I get a lot of patients that come in with oddities in their health that are. Hard to explain from conventional perspectives. And yeah. so now there's this understanding that it's actually electricity and magnetism and water and light. That's what drives our biology. Now we can get to the bottom of some of these things, you know? Well, yeah, so but I mean, the obstacle. Fundamentally understand from a different perspective what's going on in our health. I, I'm I'm so so much in in agreement with you, but you know the the obstacles are economic obstacles and, and various organizations that profit from this. Yeah. They're pretty powerful, and you know. Yeah, quite- I think the power is in the consumers. If we and patients, if we become aware and self educated, you know, like you shared, all those ways to enhance your easy water, they're completely free and abundantly available. And that's the essence of my book that I wrote: is to empower ourselves with that knowledge. Go ground in the earth, go get sunlight, go hug your children and your pets, go hug a tree, you know, like. Absolutely. These are not expensive solutions to these big problems that we have. Yeah, they're inexpensive solutions and and they have great power. Yeah. All we need to do is do them. (laughs) That's that's the issue. Yeah. 
You're so right about that. Um, so I want to give you a big hug. <laughs> Thank you. Likewise. So your discoveries about the fourth face of water has generated a prototype for the rechargeable solar battery system. Yep. And also this filterless filter. You're able to harvest the easy water and turn it from H three O two back to H two O. Well, yeah. two technologies. When will they become commercially viable, and what are how can we actually use them to change our lives? We formed a company that's called. It was not my idea. It's called Fourth Phase <laughs> Incorporated, the company. And uh, and we're moving in that direction. Uh, of course, we're we're looking for investment. We have had um, substantial investment. We need more to develop the technologies. is is a real challenge. You know, we have these things working in a laboratory setting. And in a laboratory setting, for example, with this filterless filter, it's a filter that basically collects easy water, and the easy water you know, excludes all of the junk that you don't want in the water. And that's the beauty of it. And the problem is that the the version that we have in the laboratory is is it produces just a trickle of water, and if you want to go from a trickle to a sizable uh, throughput that is is practically useful, it's a big change and a big challenge in technology. We've gone quite a ways in developing it, and we can now produce much much more water, but it's still at the point where we need to improve it. So, if you say how many years or how many months. I can't really say it depends on the investment that we get, but the future is is huge. And one of the things that we're really looking forward to is it, um, it appears that the easy water rejects salt. And so if you can take ocean water and put it through this filter and get the easy water out, the easy water should be salt free. You know? And we have some experiments that seem to indicate that. Um, and so we'd like to develop that because if we can do that, what it means is that you can take ocean water, and from the ocean water, you can produce drinking water, good drinking water. This uh, H3O2 should be excellent drinking water. And you don't need energy to do it. You just need the energy of the sun. You need infrared energy to separate the easy water from the ordinary water, basically to build or create the easy water, and then harvest that. So you can take ocean water now and get drinking water as they do a lot in the Middle East, but the energy that's required to do it is enormous. You can do it by reverse osmosis, but, but it's affordable only for you know, com- uh, countries like Saudi Arabia where oil is plentiful, uh, mm-hmm. energy is, is plentiful. It's not practical in, in third world countries. And so we're, we're hopeful that we can actually do this um, and, and produce salt-free uh, water. It just needs investment, and, and investment is always you know, a challenge to, uh, to get. But we're excited about it, and um, we have a first-rate group of people uh, who are involved in this. And so how long will it be? <laughs> I wish I could say perhaps... Mm perhaps a year or two, or it just it just depends on the level of investment, which then dictates the number of people we can have working on it. What about the solar battery system? Well, right now, um, and that we, we want to develop too, but the company is small enough that we felt the need to focus. So that one is on, on the back burner for the moment. The beauty of it um, is that it, it doesn't deplete the earth of, of its um, uh, resources which is otherwise necessary for solar cells, for photovoltaics. But this is just built, it's just water, you know, water and light. That's all you need to to do it. So theoretically, uh, it should be possible. And to bring it up to practicality, though, involves a lot of technology and and therefore uh, a lot of investment. So if, you know, anybody who's, who's listening is interested, just contact me and I'll, put you in contact with the CEO could be interesting. Since energy is so, water is so sensitive to energy, so does it, it must matter hugely. The, you know, they talk about sacred sites that have special energies. These devices must work better in specific sacred sites where the earth has special energy. Some well, interaction of the earth's energy with the sun's energy, uh, the location must matter hugely. I think it does matter hugely. And some of these sites, some of my colleagues have been looking, looking into these and, 
and, and the water from Lourdes, for example, and from the Ganges and such, the waters are different. Um, I, I've seen physical chemical studies on these, and, uh, and they show, one of the things they show is actually the characteristic absorption of EZ water. We know, we can tell if there's EZ water because EZ water absorbs light at a wavelength of 270 nanometers. It's like a signature of, of this kind of water. And I've seen uh, studies of, uh, of some of these waters at sacred sites, and many of them do have this absorption at something close to 270 nanometers. And other spring waters that you can find uh, in various places, I think the reasons, the reasons that they're as, as good as they are for health, two, two reasons. See, I think the easy water is critical, and the question is, what kinds of waters have a lot of EZ? So the first thing is that if the water is deep from a spring, got lots of water on top of it, and the water exerts pressure, and we know that pressure builds EZ. We did experimental studies on that. So the water is going to have EZ. And the second is the minerals that are in the water. Uh, a lot of these springs are mineralized, and as you say, it does depend on location as to which minerals. When you have a mineral uh, in, in, in the water, EZ builds around those molecules. And so you get EZ because of the presence of those minerals. So when you, when you drink the spring water, as I said, many of these spring waters are abundant in, in EZ water. And I think that's one of the reasons for, for uh, the promotion of health. That's why people feel good when they drink these spring waters. What kind of water do you like to drink? Uh -huh. At first, you know, at first, I, I thought we, sh we should not drink any particular kind of water because when asked that question, as you've just asked, it's a kind of Im implicit um, advertisement for that kind of water. Oh. And my wife said, you're stupid. Why don't we just drink all those waters instead of none of those waters? <laughs> <laughs> and she's right. Um, and so we drink a lot of different waters. Um, Do you use special vortexing machines or different machines to charge up your water? Yeah, we have uh, installed in the house is a, uh, on the main intake is a vortex. It's a very simple one. It's made of copper. Someone It was a gift from someone. And it just twists, twirls the water around in a vortex. And that and, has been found to increase easy water? Well, yes and no. Uh, in, in my book, I present one graph that shows a, an increase, but this needs to be studied in great detail. It's actually a challenge to study because if the water is being vortexed, um, it's not in a stable situation and it's hard to make measurements. It's possible, it's possible that the changes that occur in something that's vortex are transient. They're, they're occurring just during the vortexing or maybe slightly after it. But then if you take the water and bring it to the laboratory and put it through the test, by the time you do that, the, the advantage... It has lost its structure. It yeah. might be. Yeah, it might be. We're not sure. And we haven't invested a lot of time in, into studying vortex water. But Victor Schauberger, the great naturalist, was talking about vortex water as as being so-called living water instead of dead water, and and having the so-called so living living processes. And intuitively, it feels right that water that's moving instead of water that's stagnant is <clears throat> is going to be more helpful. So we we think it's possible that this this water that vortex properly vortex water may create easy. Uh, Versus has been said that the 90 degree pipes of our city water systems is breaking, is devitalizing the water. I've heard this. I haven't heard that. Uh, but Because uh, water naturally would never want to move in a 90 degree. So it's a, it's a, a kind of yeah. violence that we're doing to the water by moving. Yeah, you're, I hear you. It's certainly unnatural to go yeah. to turn 90 degrees. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it makes good sense. I, I agree with you. What other waters do you drink? Well, so, so we have an alkaline water machine uh, at home. Um, there are some waters uh, right now we're drinking a water called Davinia water. This is a water that um, is produced by, by a friend of mine. And uh, I've seen hospital records showing that this water has the capacity to, to reverse irreversible kidney pathology. Um, and uh, it's Pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, we also have some spring water that comes from a spring that is used, has been used by Native Americans for uh, 
hundreds, if not thousands of years for, for health. Uh, we've got some from New Zealand. People, as a gift, they give us, hey, try this water. And I've got, sitting on my desk, I've got four bottles of something and sitting behind me are some additional bottles. So so there are many that, that we drink. You know, I it, it's, it's hard to predict and hard to say which ones are genuinely good for health. We can theorize, but the only real way to do it, I think, is to do clinical trials. And yeah. as you know, to do it properly is a huge job uh, requiring many people and a lot of time and probably something like $5 million to run a, a, a decent study. And who is interested in you know, uh, supplying $5 million to study waters? Except I think if we really listen to how our bodies feel when we drink different waters, we can discern if something gives us an aliveness or something makes us feel dead. I agree with you. Yeah, sure. And you're particularly sensitive. You can do I had um, one of the questions I emailed to you, which I mentioned in my book, is that an old Chinese medicine professor of mine used to say, oh, you want to balance the yin and yang energy of your body, you drink a water that is 50% boiling water, 50% ice. I've been drinking that in my mornings on a regular basis. Do you think that's a, a way to make a cup of easy water? Uh, yeah, it's possible. Uh, I, I think it would be worth testing. Uh, so we do know uh, that when you take ice, when you melt the ice, the, the, the melt from the ice, it doesn't go from ice to water. It goes from ice to easy water and then uh, to ordinary water. So there's an intermediate phase. In fact, if you want to freeze the water, it's the same thing. You go from uh, from water to easy water and then to ice. The easy is always an intermediate step and so if you take um if you take ice and you put boiling water on it it's going to melt i suppose pretty quickly and i would could imagine that you get an abundance of uh, easy water when you go through that process it'd be interesting to do some experiments and try it <laughs> you know? well at least i feel confident it's harmless practice that i'm doing you know and it's fun and i feel great so could be placebo but if it's easy water that's that's huge because everybody could do that for their health it's, it's really really easy yeah I, I know that some people just take ice water and freshly uh, melted um, ice and drink that it wouldn't be a Difficult experiment to try. I, I'm going to put it on my little notepad here. Because <laughs> isn't it true that hot water freezes faster than cold water? Uh, yes. Um, so that hot water is closer to easy water, and then that freshly melted ice is also easy water. So it's kind of like a double easy water. It it, it, it could be, um, and it's really worth studying. We, <laughs> I'm excited of... to hear the results. I've been doing this for years now, so... Well, I, the, the results are obviously good because you look so healthy, <laughs> <laughs> so it must be. <laughs> so I want to be respectful of, of your time because I could talk to you for days and days and days because this well, is endlessly fascinating yeah. to me. And I hope um, you would permit me to interview you again in the future because I love talking about all these things. Absolutely. Um, as we wrap up, can you please tell our audience how we can stay in touch with you and how we can support your continued awesome work that you do? Oh, well, thank you so much. Okay, um, staying in, in touch. Email is the best way. People telephone me, but somehow the telephone doesn't, I sometimes never get to um, to answering and I'm hither and yon. And so it's GHP, as in Gerald Harvey Pollitt, GHP at U dot Washington, spelled out, dot E-D-U, as in education. A GHP at u.washington.edu. In terms of of, of the research, um, you know, all all contributions are, are are welcome. It's as I mentioned earlier, it, it's it's difficult to get money from the uh, granting agencies because you know if you if you tell them that you want to study water, so everybody knows that water is just H two O. There's nothing interesting about water and and so it's a real challenge to get them even to pay attention to read the proposal. And I've I've kind of almost given up uh, getting money from from the agencies because it takes too much time to prepare those applications. And 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 so we we have a, a few people, very kind benefactors, who are helping us. Um, we could always use more because 
uh, there's so much to do. And so anybody who would like to make a contribution, it, it's it's on our lab website. I don't have the URL in, in front of me, but... Um, it's it's pollocklab.org. Is that the one? No, it's Pollock Lab. Well, I, I, I don't actually know, but an email, I could get, get you to it or just search under Pollock Lab website. Um, there may be different Pollocks. So it's Gerald Pollock, University of Washington Lab website. I'm not sure it'll come up. So Pollock is spelled P-O-L-L-A-C-K right. lab dot right. org. And then you can get, I think you can get all your links there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Or, or just, just email me. Um, okay. We would be really, really thrilled and pleased at uh, contributions, and they they go a long way. The research is expensive, you know. If you just hire uh, one postdoctoral fellow, for example, it, when by the time you pay the fringe benefits and and the salary, it's like seventy seventy five thousand dollars per year. Um, not Maybe much. we don't totally know, but give us a brief overview of kind of the future world where if we really pursue this line of inquiry with the water science, at least, we're talking about free energy. It's, a, it's almost about- everything. You know, water is everywhere, not only on our planet, but increasingly on other, other planets throughout the solar system. So water is extremely fundamental. And my friend... Uh, Luc Montagnier, uh, who is a Nobel Prize winner and has been studying uh, water, he's come to the conclusion based on his experiments that that water came before DNA, that the information that we think of as stored in DNA probably came first as information stored in water and w- with with the DNA being maybe a, a more stable repository for information. So that's how fundamental it is. And there's now... A for, lot for those of who aren't familiar, I'd love to just pause for a second. He discovered that he was able to duplicate DNA in two test tubes by just exposing them to each other and then exposing a, a very low frequency replica of the Earth's Schumann resonance. And then water captured the information and produced DNA as yeah. if from thin air, just from the energy field. Yeah, it's it just, sounds like science fiction, actually. But it's well, some, true. some people think it is science fiction, but it's been replicated now by in, in enough laboratories that it, it looks real. It's not just him. Other, other people now have a lot of information about, about information stored in water. And by the way, easy water is a perfect substrate for that because it's a crystal and has regularly disposed points in the crystal, uh, oxygens and hydrogens. And, and each one of these is a potential... Um, a storage spot. So oxygen, for example, can have five different oxidation states, uh, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. So it's got like, five, instead of having a zero and a one, it's got five different states. You can imagine the information density that could be stored in the matrix containing a lot of those regularly disposed oxygens. It's, uh, it's huge. It's wow. possible one day that digital computer memories will be built of easy water. And so for, for, for us, for the world, for how our body functions and how, how every biological substance functions, the idea of information and memory, although controversial 20 years ago, 25 years ago, now so much evidence is, has been put forth in favor of it. And we have a conference each year in Bulgaria. It's called the International Conference on or a conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water, and each year with three or four or five different presentations uh, by scientists demonstrating this. So this is this is of extreme interest. This is we're bringing the future to the present. This is yeah. what for those who are interested in investing in this science, we're collapsing time and really accelerating our next level of human evolution to that future state where we have access to all this technology. Absolutely. This is the future. I I think um, many people who are involved think that information and and water is one of the, the, is on the frontier, absolutely on the frontier, maybe one of the most important frontier subjects. And people people don't know about it. (laughs) Only a small um, contingent of people really know. It's like this this extreme abundance is staring us in the face and we're not tapping into it. We're not, totally. You're absolutely right. 
Beautiful. So to wrap up our call, I'd love to ask you the most important question that I ask all of our special guests, which is that this show is really about exploring the frontiers of our human possibilities. And to me, you are a pioneer amongst pioneers. You're well, so humble and so kind and so generous with your time. But I just want to say I have just I have no words to describe how much I appreciate your presence on this. Well, planet. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so so you so want what, what do you feel? What is your number one advice to our audience about awakening our fullest human potential? Oh, you do ask difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, well, uh, um, I, I guess I would have to come, come down on, um, truth seeking, finding truth, genuine truth, wherever that might, might lie. There, there's a tendency for people to, to reflexively reject ideas that don't fit into the accepted paradigm. So the, the response is, if, it, if we can't explain it very easily, it must be wrong. A lot of the people who are studying consciousness in South China, just now reading a preview of the a book that's coming out by Dean Radin entitled Real Magic. <laughs> and he, he, he talks about this, this theme that um, there, there are so many experiments that have been done, but if, if a person is, is not open to even considering uh, the results of these experiments, we don't get anywhere because because there, there there's no gain and so so by committing ourselves to truth seeking which means opening ourselves to to phenomena that we don't seem to we don't seem to have an explanation today for it we're going to gain a lot and the gain for humanity will be tremendous right now most of us feel too comfortable in our in our, our own niche of uh, in our own belief system, and we don't we don't open ourselves to what may turn out to be uh, interesting truths. So, so my advice, if you will, is is that doing this is is critically important, and it's true not only in the scientific realm but every realm. Um, you know, looking to find the absolute truth. It's like the political system also, you know, the left doesn't listen to the right, the right doesn't listen to the left, and we get nowhere. And so without an openness to, to considering our, our values and, our, our, and the truth and what makes sense, we're not going to get anywhere. So that would be, that would be my advice. Um, I love to add to what you said, that all those practices you said that enhance easy water are also the same effortless way to shift our consciousness to that more flexible, peaceful, non-confrontational, open-minded state. Absolutely. What they call the meditative state. Yeah. Not everybody knows to meditate, but grounding, earthing, sunshine, hugs, all these practices that enhance easy water also seem to overlap a lot with the meditative state. Oh uh, yeah, uh, which our minds start to open, and then we can explore and seek the truth that we're looking for. I'm right with you. That was brilliantly put. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. So there's layers and layers of contribution to the work that you're doing that I think will we can't even fathom the results if we actually put into practice some of your advice that you're recommending. Well, thank th thank you so much, Edith. Uh, yeah, uh, for your really compelling presence and wonderful questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jerry. That okay. was an amazing interview. I so appreciate your time. Thank you. Hi, friends. Did you love that interview? If you did, please leave a review and share with all your friends so that many more people can benefit from these game-changing insights. You can also go onto our website, dredithubuntu.com, and subscribe to our newsletter, where you'll receive free trainings and next-level ninja tools that we only share on our newsletter. Together, let's turn your life into a brilliant masterpiece.